Hi, my name is Dan Jones, and today I'm talking to Professor Harvey Whitehouse about the role of rituals in the evolution of social behaviour. Harvey is the director of the Institute for Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology at the University of Oxford and is currently heading up a multinational interdisciplinary effort called the Ritual Community and Conflict Project. Harvey, many thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Could you tell us a bit about the Ritual Community and Conflict Project, its scope and its objectives? Well, the project is a very large one. Uh, it involves collaborations across many countries from Europe to North America to uh, New Zealand and South America. Um, and it involves field research in a wide range of different countries, um, ranging from North Africa through to uh, regions of uh, Melanesia in the Pacific Ocean. Um, it's a large project because really it's asking very big questions. It's asking how rituals contribute to building cohesion within groups um, and the extent to which they contribute to conflict between groups as well. We're trying to understand how children through the course of development acquire the rituals of their communities. And we're trying to understand on an even broader canvas how ritual contributes to the evolution of social complexity. So, why are you so interested in rituals? Rituals are important for us as a species. Um, uh, yes, we're very uh, intelligent, creative, technologically uh, capable creatures, but I think part of the key to our success as a species has been our ability to cooperate on a scale that is extremely rare in the natural world. And rituals uh, provide a kind of gadget for uh, facilitating that kind of cooperation. Why does it take such a large interdisciplinary team to study rituals? Well, we're trying to understand why humans are so ritualistic. Why it is that in every human population, wherever you go in the world, people perform a great variety of rituals, uh, some of them on a very frequent daily basis, sometimes they're much rarer and bigger events, but they punctuate uh, every aspect of human life. And to explain why, we really need to break our why-type questions up into different levels. Um, we can ask questions about the immediate psychological causes for participation in rituals. We can ask questions about why uh, children seem to sponge up so naturally the ritualistic traditions of the communities around them. We can ask questions about how prior forms of various rituals have shaped the ones that have emerged over time. And we can ask questions about uh, the functions of rituals, the role that they play in human societies. Um, these are four quite different kinds of questions that require different kinds of expertise. So to explain uh, uh, aspects of ritual that involve understanding prior forms, we have to work with historians and archaeologists. To understand the immediate proximate causes, we have to work with experimental psychologists. To understand how they develop in childhood, Obviously, we need to work with developmental psychologists um, and so on. So this is a project that requires expertise from a great variety of disciplines and not just from one. There's another reason why it has to be large and interdisciplinary, and that is that um, when you look at most of the evidence that's come out of experimental psychology to help us explain uh, patterns of recurrence and, and, and uh, similarity in, in uh, human thinking and behaviour worldwide, um, it draws its evidence primarily from a, a rather unusual sample, primarily undergraduates at primarily Western universities. Um, the problem with that is that the sample is weird. We call it weird in the sense of Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic. Uh, democratic. So it's a kind of acronym for all of these rather unusual traits. Um, I think important as the research is that's been done on weird populations, we do also need to verify that um, in non-weird populations uh, that the same uh, experimental uh, procedures produce, yield the same kinds of results. And uh, in many cases where they don't, um, that too can be illuminating and can help us to understand how uh, rituals function in different cultural environments in different ways. We've been talking about rituals, but what exactly do you mean? By ritual. Rituals are essentially conventions as opposed to uh, behaviours that are th that way because they're technically useful. Um, 
I guess you could say that um, you know a, a good example of a of a ritualistic kind of behaviour is the rule that you should wear your tie over the top button in order to look smart. Um, it's certainly true that a lot of clothes serve a very uh, clear function to keep out the cold or to protect you from rain or whatever. But there are these special rules that don't make any sense in technical or instrumental terms. It's that way because that's the done or the proper way to do it. If there was a rule saying that we should wear ties on our head, that would be the convention and we'd have to do it that way. But there's no technical reason for it. It might help to tell you the, the story that developmental psychologists like to tell about Sylvia, who uh, was a very accomplished cook and used to have a special way of preparing meat for the oven. She'd chop off the ends of the meat and one day when her elderly mother was visiting, her mother commented on it in surprise and Sylvia said, what do you mean mum? We've always done it that way. Ever since we were little kids, you, you used to cut off the ends of the meat. and." Uh, her mum said, yes, but when you were little kids, the pan that we put the meat in was too small for the joint. Um, so she had a perfectly instrumental technical reason for doing it, but little Sylvia, as a child growing up, had adopted a ritual stance on the behaviour and had assumed that this was a convention, a proper way of preparing meat. In your work, you often talk about the notion of causal opacity. Uh, could you explain exactly what this means? Rituals are causally opaque in the sense that we uh, don't expect there to be a coherent causal structure to the action sequences. Um, how can I put this? If you imagine something like uh, the kit that anglers use um, to uh, collect fish from the water, the rod and the reel and the line and the hook and the bait are all quite clearly contributing uh, to the desired end goal of extracting fish from the water. And even bits of it that we can't directly see, like the inner workings of the reel, are assumed to have the properties that they do so as to um, contribute most efficiently to the casting out of the line or the reeling in of the fish. With rituals, all those assumptions essentially go out the window. Uh, when we behold, when we uh, look at a ritual action, we assume that it would be quite uh, inappropriate to uh, ask, well, how does that each component of the action contribute uh, to the end goal through normal causation. If you think of something like, I don't know, uh, the process of knighting somebody, why should they kneel down? Why should the sword be tapped on one shoulder and then on the other, and then they get asked to rise to their feet? Nobody would expect there to be a coherent causal explanation for that. It's just the way it's done. It's the proper way. Okay, so that explains the notion of causal opacity, but why is it so important to understand causal opacity, to understand rituals? I think causal opacity, or the propensity to, to copy causally opaque behaviour, um, is an evolved feature of uh, uniquely human psychology. Uh, other primates wouldn't copy causally opaque behaviour. Um, you don't find uh, chimps, um, I don't know, uh, bowing to each other or doing the goose step or doing any of the remarkable uh, peculiar behaviours, ritualistic behaviours that humans engage in. Um, chimps will copy each other, they do engage in social learning, but they're interested in behaviours that have a um, transparent causal structure where you can see how doing the behaviour produces a desired outcome. Um, so no self-respecting, non-human primate would copy behaviour that they can't see uh, how it generates anything useful. Um, but they're missing something really important, because by doing these strange, uh, causally opaque behaviours, humans bind themselves together into groups. They mark out their identities as members of groups. And the very motivation, the deep motivation to participate in rituals seems to be rooted in a desire to affiliate with other individuals. So you've suggested that a uh, tendency to imitate and copy causally opaque behaviours is an evolved trait of human nature. Do you have any evidence from humans to support this? One of the clues to uh, the evolved origins of uh, this propensity to copy causally opaque behaviour is the fact that it, it's a propensity that emerges really early in development. 
Um, actually, that makes sense because if you think about it, acquiring all the arbitrary phonemes of a language um, requires a willingness to accept that purely on the basis of convention, that kind of utterance refers to that kind of object in the world. Um, it, I guess, a lot of the really interesting uh, work on uh, how the copying of causally opaque behaviour emerges in childhood um, is associated with research on what psychologists call over-imitation. That's to say a willingness to copy aspects of a behaviour that have no obvious contribution to make to the end goal. Um, a lot of the research on that topic for a long time was uh, using puzzle boxes as the main sort of experimental paradigm. So children were shown uh, a, a, a very highly elaborated way of opening a box and getting something out of it. And some of the actions involved in the box opening were clearly unnecessary, or at any rate there was no obvious contribution that they were making to the end goal of extracting something from the box. So. Uh, psychologists tended to assume that the reason why children would over-imitate, uh, that's to say copy elements of the action model to them that made no contribution to the end goal, was because they were adopting a sort of copy all, correct later strategy, whereby I don't know at this present moment how that funny action model to me is doing anything useful, but I'll assume that this person, I'll trust this person not to teach me something useless, right? So, um, but the interesting thing is that even when psychologists told children that the uh, model behavior was going to contain irrelevant, unnecessary or silly bits, um, and not to bother copying those, the children still copied them. It's as if they couldn't help themselves. So if this copy or correct later strategy is being adopted by children, it would suggest it's being adopted at a level that's not entirely conscious. Um, this whole line of thinking does make a lot of sense, but uh, I got to discussing this with uh, developmental psychologist Christine Laguerre at the University of Texas some years ago, and together we um, uh, had a shared hunch, if you like, that that's not all that's going on. That in some cases, far from uh, adopting behaviours that might prove useful, but will sort of reserve judgment for the time being, children were copying causally opaque behaviour because they thought it had some kind of conventional value. In other words, it might be the proper or the done way to do it, and for that reason they were copying it. To test this hunch, we designed a series of experiments. Our first one uh, involved modelling to children aged four to six years old an action sequence using novel objects. Um, and there were two conditions in this experiment. In one condition, the objects, uh, and one of the objects at the very end of the sequence ended up in a box. So there was a kind of suggestion that there was an end goal. This was following the sort of puzzle box paradigm, if you like. In the other condition, Exactly the same procedures were followed, except that the last object was just placed back where it had originally been. So all the objects ended up where they started. So there's no even, not even a hint of an end goal. And what did we find? We found that children copied the end start state equivalent uh, condition in, in that condition far more uh, rigidly and innovated less than in the condition where you had an end goal. So it was, it's, it's sort of provided some grist for our mill, if you like, that the desire to copy that kind of behaviour was driven by something other than the wish to learn useful, technically useful, instrumental behaviours. Uh, and building on that paradigm, we've shown that um, uh, children are very sensitive to verbal cues that's might, that suggest that a model behaviour is a conventional behaviour, in other words, a ritual in our terms. You've said that rituals bind groups of people together, but how exactly did they do this? It seems that from a very early age, um, children are inclined to copy causally opaque behaviour as a sort of affiliative, um, or in a way that's motivated by desire to be part of the group. Um, in fact, one of my students, uh, Rachel Watson-Jones, has done some marvellous experiments showing that uh, when children are concerned about the risk of being excluded from groups, they copy 
causally opaque behaviour far more uh, rigidly uh, than they would if the behaviour in question were purely instrumental or goal-driven. So does that mean that all rituals bind groups of people together in the same ways? Well, what we've found is that uh, when it comes to collective rituals, rituals that people do in groups, there are really two quite different ways in which rituals manage to bind groups together. Um, one way of doing it is to put people through an experience they'll never forget, like an extremely painful initiation, for example, or some other kind of ritualized torture that sort of sears itself into your episodic memory or memory for important life events um, and becomes a kind of focus for um, reflection and thought subsequently and becomes part of your uh, sense of who you are. Um, that kind of a ritual um, produces intensely powerful and enduring bonds between participants because they feel like together they've experienced and shared something really unique and important and self-shaping that people who haven't done the ritual couldn't possibly understand. And that kind of uh, ritual that binds people in that way we refer to as imagistic ritual. It's a bit of jargon but basically the idea is that it sears images into our brains in a way and in a, in a way that's never to be forgotten. Another way in which rituals bind groups together is by getting people to perform them on a very regular basis, maybe daily, maybe weekly, um, so that the uh, experience um, uh, is something that you don't think of as dis a series of distinct episodes in your life history, but instead forms part of your sort of general knowledge of how to behave in order to be a competent member of the group. Um, that kind of we call it routinized ritual, which basically means highly repetitive kinds of rituals, um, is, is really well suited to establishing a standardized body of teachings and practices across a really large area. In part, that's because doing it frequently makes it very easy for participants to spot when somebody steps out of line and uh, performs uh, some little variant of their own, innovates in other words, um, and it may be that there are mechanisms for policing that that are quite uh, in institutionalized in the religion. Um, we call this the doctrinal mode of religiosity because it tends to be associated with a lot of explicit doctrine and teachings. Uh, using the same mechanism of repetition to ensure that they become stabilised, standardised across the tradition as a whole. And that kind of doctrinal mode uh, of religiosity is um, characteristic of much larger groups than those that we call imagistic, which bind together just small groups of people who go through experiences together. Could you explain uh, a bit more about imagistic rituals and how they have the effects they have? I think imagistic rituals uh, create a sense of family connection among people who perform them together. And one of the, uh, well, let's unpack that a little bit. I mean, think about what it's like to live in families. I mean, what, one of the really uh, striking things about that experience is that you go through the sort of trials and tribulations of life, the things that, the rough stuff that life throws at you, you go through it with your family members. Um, and those shared experiences would seem to play a very important role in bonding families together. Um, this makes a lot of sense in evolutionary terms. You imagine the sorts of environments in which our ancestors were struggling for survival. They form small uh, family or kin-based groups um, in which uh, sticking together and, um, you know, through thick and thin, uh, created a sense of shared experience that we think um, uh, serves as a kind of phenotypic marker, if you like. It, it sort of picks out the people you remember going through stuff like that with are the people that you more or less um, can bet will be related to you. So those are the people you want to invest in. And what we think happens with imagistic rituals is that they kind of hijack that mechanism. Uh, what they do is they create artificially some pretty extreme experiences. Um, they create this sense of sharing those very life-changing experiences with others. And what they do in the process of doing that is they break down the sort of boundary or they render the boundary porous between the personal self and the social self. We all have a personal self 
that's built out of our sort of autobiographical memories apart from anything else you know the things that we've experienced that have gone into shaping the person we are today the things that make you you and what make me me um, but when we feel like we share those experiences with other people uh, it's almost as if those other people become in a way an extension of us um, and uh, in that sense we produce a kind of psychological kinship with them uh, social psychologists or group psychologists have been studying this phenomenon for some time and they refer to it as identity fusion so people like Bill Swan at the University of Texas and Angel Cormez at, uh, in Madrid have been showing that um, most people are fused with their families, that's the main target for fusion, uh, and this is true all around the world. But what we think is happening in imagistic rituals is that exactly the same kinds of mechanisms are being artificially triggered, producing a strong sense of psychological kinship in larger groups, groups of, say, fellow initiates who went through uh, a, a particularly grisly ordeal together, for example. One of the effects of uh, having rituals like this is that um, those who have been bonded through it will be more um, willing to stand by each other, even when there are very strong temptations to run away or defect. For example, in situations of warfare, frankly, we find uh, imagistic practices are most frequent in military groups, uh, in uh, not just uh, modern militaries where we have things like hazing practices and so on, but in traditional uh, warring societies uh, and um, what we're trying to do is to show through lab-based experiments that um, manipulating levels of dysphoria that's to say fear and pain experienced by co-participants in an activity uh, will increase their sense of uh, commitment to each other their willingness to cooperate and to support group causes. So you've explained what imagistic practice is all about but what's this doctrinal mode that you've talked about? How does that work? The doctrinal mode is essentially, uh, we think, about building social identities as distinct from personal identities. So whereas the imagistic mode is about sort of making the boundary between the personal and the social more porous, um, in a sense, the, the doctrinal mode is, it really demarcates that boundary clearly and tries to attach people to a social role, in effect. Um, the way to understand this is that when you engage in the same kinds of rituals day in, day out, and you hear the same kinds of doctrines being repeated on a regular basis, even though you already know them, uh, you create a, a set of, of, of scripts in your mind for how to do these things properly, how to participate correctly, uh, what kinds of things to say as a devout or proper member of the community. Um, and those things are constitutive of a social self. When you represent them uh, psychologically, you don't represent specific people. You represent roles, people adopting uh, the role of congregant or priest or doing specialised roles very often um, in a, a sort of, uh, uh, as, as part of your ge general knowledge of the world. We, psychologists call this semantic memory, but it's essentially your general knowledge. Um, and that way of representing uh, institutional arrangements, teachings, practices, is um, essentially depersonalizing. You don't, you don't have flesh and blood individuals inhabiting your memories of how to do the thing correctly. Um, so activation of your social self doesn't make your personal self salient. It doesn't uh, pull in the agency and motivational systems of the personal self. So being um, you know, identifying with a group does motivate cooperation and it does um, uh, promote a certain amount of, of sort of willingness to defend your group uh, in competition with other groups, but uh, not with the same intensity as identity fusion. Um, so the doctrinal mode is another, uh, plays off a different kind of psychology, the psychology of big group thinking, really. Um, our ethnic psychology is another way of, of describing it. We've already mentioned uh, some of the links between religion and ritual, but what do you see as the deep connections, if any, between rituals and religion? I don't think there's any necessary connection between religion and ritual. It depends, of course, what we mean by religion, but if, if we mean by that simply a belief in supernatural agency, for example, it's not obvious to me that that would necessarily require participation in rituals. And of course, 
there are many examples of religious traditions that don't go in for a lot of ritual. Um, and conversely, there are examples of secular movements and organizations of, of many kinds that are highly ritualistic and don't have any sort of supernatural agent beliefs. Um, so I don't think those two things are necessarily connected. I think ritual is a way of binding groups together of all kinds, whether or not they entail beliefs in gods. It's common to hear, from some people at least, that the world would be a better place without religion and its associated rituals. Do you agree? I'm not sure the world would be a better place without religion. I think religion has played a really uh, important role in the evolution of social complexity. Um, and uh, it's done so probably in a variety of ways. Um, some of my colleagues have argued, um, I think very persuasively, that the appearance, the first appearance of really uh, sort of moralizing high gods, that's to say gods that take an interest in you and what you do and punish you when you uh, transgress against uh, the group or against a set of values that the group holds dear, that that god will punish you and, uh, and that this could motivate more pro-social behavior, uh, particularly important in large societies where under the cloak of anonymity people might uh, you know, be tempted to commit crimes hoping that no one will notice and recognize who did it. Um, but if there's a supernatural watcher up there, um, it might be a deterrent against um, antisocial behavior. Even if it doesn't deter bad behavior, it could be that it promotes trust in society. A belief in a powerful and punitive deity um, might be a way of flagging to other people that uh, you'd be good to do business with. Because if you believe that I believe in some kind of uh, powerful punitive deity, you might be more likely to trust me uh, in the absence of more detailed information about my personal character and history than that guy over there whose beliefs are unknown, right? Um, so there are all kinds of ways in which religion can help to build trust and cooperation, particularly in large groups. These things aren't really a focus of our current project, um, but our current project focuses on how a stepping up of the frequency of rituals allows people to cooperate in larger and larger groups uh, by sharing the same identity markers across really large populations. Um, one thing that does seem strikingly to be the case is that it's the arrival of the ethical religions that really pushes societies towards uh, greater concerns with justice and fairness and, and essentially makes us uh, more democratic and in that sense more egalitarian. You've argued that religion is a force for good, or at least has been a force for good, but isn't it also the case that religion, in the modern world at least, is also responsible for a great many ills, conflict between groups and things like suicide terrorism? We don't really know the extent to which um, religious beliefs or values drive uh, extreme behaviour. Um, it does appear to be the case that when people hold certain values sacred, uh, that's to say um, non-negotiable, they won't take any kind of material compensation for having those values compromised in any way, um, that they, uh, those values evince very strong commitment and certainly endorsement of violence. Um, whether they actually motivate people to strap bombs to themselves and uh, you know put the, basically to lay down their lives for the group or for the cause um, is uh, an, uh, an important question but one which I don't think has been satisfactorily resolved. Um, one possibility and I think it's a plausible one is that um, when people engage in extreme behaviours they're acting not in so much out of, uh, not so much driven by a cause or something as abstract as that. Um, they do it not for beliefs but for each other it, because they're really bonded typically to very small groups in the same way that imagistic rituals bind people together. It may even be through ritual practices that they have become bonded in that way or it may be something more like the standard ways in which families bond. Um, but I think people who uh, put themselves in the firing line for the group and people who uh, deliberately um, uh, die for the group by strapping bombs to themselves, I think there's a very, very powerful sense of commitment of a familial kind to a sort of band of brothers, to a small core of people with whom they've undergone shared experiences 
Um, and it's, it's that more than the abstract idea of some kind of religious belief or value that drives the behaviour. But these are empirical questions and we need more research to, into these topics to find the answer. Perhaps the most ambitious aspect of the Ritual Community and Conflict Project is your attempt to look at the role that rituals have played in societies and in social evolution over the past 10,000 years. How exactly are you looking at this question and what might you find? We start at the very end of the Paleolithic and our interest um, there is to look at the role that rituals played in the transition, uh, such a consequential transition as it turned out, from foraging to farming, from small group living to very much larger settlements and eventually to states and, and uh, empires. Um, so, uh, wh well that means going into prehistory obviously, and we, we um, uh, try to find clues as to uh, the kinds of rituals that people were performing in ancient foraging societies and how those, the signature of those ritual practices changed with the transition to a more settled uh, kind of lifestyle where you're cultivating crops and domesticating animals. Um, one of the kinds of rituals that we can look at in the archaeological record is feasting events from the animal remains and another kind we can look at is burial rituals uh, from the human remains. Um, those two kinds of rituals are particularly important to us because we do see a change, a shift from uh, what looks to be l l sort of communal rituals in which the community is bound together through really quite intense practices um, in the world of foragers to a world where farmers are conducting more frequent rituals, often in domestic spaces. Um, and when they do come together, it's in a more celebratory way rather than the sort of imagistic things that we associate with small group bonding. Exciting as the archaeological evidence is to work with, um, obviously documented history provides a lot more detail on many of the topics that interest us. So one of the biggest challenges is to organise what has been learned by professional historians about a huge range of different time periods in different places. Um, to learn from them what the sort of broad patterns are in correlational terms between variables of interest. Um, so, for example, uh, we're interested in testing the hypothesis that before you can get really large groups, you have to increase the frequency of rituals being performed uh, within those groups. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a prediction, if you like. And the only way to test that is to have a huge number of examples um, so that you can't be accused of just cherry picking ones that fit your theory. Um, and to be able to do that, we have to create a database into which uh, information uh, garnered from the historical record has been um, sort of recoded. Um, so it's not in the format that traditionally historians would present it. You can imagine what a formidable task that is. Um, obviously, we can read vast amount of, a vast amount of um, uh, work of professional historians, um, and that's not a bad way to get started. But we are also really need the input of professional historians directly to um, ensure that the quality of the data is as good as we can get it, and to help us uh, find um, more difficult to track down materials. Um, so to that end, we've um, begun to develop quite extensive collaborations with historians um, who are essentially our partners in building this um, uh, database, which uh, is going to take a long time to complete. It'll probably outlive me, I hope it will, and eventually become a public, uh, publicly accessible resource that uh, can be used to test a much wider range of hypotheses about the human past. It won't replace traditional history at all, but it will uh, be a new way of using the resources of traditional historical re research to test questions uh, arising out of the evolutionary sciences.